We're live. We're recording. That's the first time. Lord, I need you, I guess.
tonight. It's communion. I'm going to be coming out of Isaiah 55. Mm. <clears throat> the invitation to the Lord's salvation. It says, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does, does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. See how I used to use him to display my power among the peoples. I made him a tender. I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations you do not know, and peoples unknown to you will come running to obey. Because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst in the song and the trees will, of the field will clap their hands. Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. There will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. So, with that, let's take a moment to um, get our hearts right with with the Lord, align our hearts with His. And thank Him for all He's done. Take communion as a family.
right. Let me pray for our time. Man, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for providing an opportunity to meet with you. And Jesus, man, with this time that you have given us, Lord Jesus, I pray that this is glorifying to you. That this time that we meet together isn't just an ordinary time, but this is a time that we bring honor and glory to your name. And Jesus, we know that you have given us your spirit, and we know that your spirit is passionate about being faithful to you, Lord Jesus. I pray that we don't live in a way that stifles your spirit, Lord Jesus. But we actually seek every opportunity to be filled with your spirit. We follow convictions. We rejoice in correction. Um, we, we love to be pointed back on the path that you want us to be on because we know it brings honor to your name. For your name's sake, Lord Jesus. And so I pray for a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit to fill the lives of your people, Lord Jesus us as a church so we can glorify you and build one another up in your presence. Man, so Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, so Jesus wanted me to talk about stifling the Spirit today. Um, and man, Jesus wants us to understand how important it is that we live in a way that we're not stifling the Spirit. And Jesus wants us to understand how precious the Holy Spirit is in our life, and that without it we would be lost. Uh, the Holy Spirit leads us into truth. It convicts us. It corrects us and guides us. Right? It brings honor and glory to God. And this is the Holy Spirit. This is because of the cross. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Now, that word stifle means to extinguish. It's, it's a picture of a fire extinguisher spraying out a fire, right? And that fire is the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our hearts. Right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. This is the fruit of the Spirit, and this is character. This is the righteous character produced in our lives by Jesus Christ. This is how we bring much glory and praise to God by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is passionate about being faithful to God. The Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the counselor. These are a few of the names of the Holy Spirit in, in pointing to his title in our lives. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, right? So, Jesus wants to show us uh, three different ways that the Holy Spirit convicts us and it's going to show us throughout there how we stifle the Holy Spirit if we don't follow these convictions. So the first uh, is the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. So he convicts us so we can respond, right? He wants us to turn from ourselves and turn to his ways. Not following convictions will stifle the Spirit. And we know knowing what we ought to do and not doing it is sin, right? Right? So sin separates us from God. That's a huge deal. That's a huge deal. So it says, sin is anything out of God's design. Following any way other than God's way is sin. Uh, Genesis 1.27. You guys know this scripture. It's identity verse. This is our identity in Christ, right? It says, so God created human beings in his image. In the Im image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. So it's in the image of God we were created and we were uh, 
uh, to bring glory to him by being fruitful and multiplied, to, to fill the world with himself. This brings him much glory. To look down on the sixth day and he said everything was very good. Everything that he created was very good. Right? This is through his character. This is through his image being displayed through our life. <clears throat> so we were created to be image bearers to reflect the image of God. So any image that we are reflecting other than the image of God is sin. So a good question to ask ourselves is, whose image are you reflecting? Matthew 22. Uh, this is uh, when the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something which he could be arrested for. They sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the taxes. When they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, he said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. See, Jesus, Caesar was of the world, right? He was reflecting the world's image. Uh, you can tell just by the money, right? It's a worldly thing. It's passing away, but we're called to belong to God and reflect his image into the world. Right? We belong to God. He bought us with uh, the precious blood spilled on the cross. So we belong to him, so we should reflect his image. So again, whose image are you reflecting? The second thing is God, he, he can, or the Holy Spirit convicts us of God's righteousness, which this shows us where we are wrong and where we don't line up. So thinking better than we are, thinking we are better than we are stifles the Holy Spirit. Romans 3.10 says, No one is righteous, not even one. And Jesus says, I have come to call those who think, not those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. So there is one that is good, and that person is Jesus Christ. He is fair, just, perfect, and without fault in every way. Romans 3.23 and 26. So it says, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sin. <coughs> Bless you. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. So if we're struggling with believing in Jesus, that can cycle the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're struggling to have faith in Jesus that can stifle the Holy Spirit. So the third thing is uh, convicts on the coming judgment. John 3, 16 and 17 says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So he sent Jesus to save us. It was a redemption plan to ransom us from the empty life that we inherited from our ancestors. And he did that through the cross. <clears throat> Verse 36 in John 3. It says, And anyone who believes in God's Son <clears throat> has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life but will remain under God's angry judgment. <clears throat> so God, God commands us to love the Lord God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. 
He doesn't say some of your heart, some of your soul, some of your strength. But he says all. All means all, and that's all all means. It's every part of us, our first, our best, and our all. <clears throat> and it says, love your neighbor as yourself. So by not obeying Jesus, that stifles the Holy Spirit, and that leads to God's angry judgment. Uh, listen to this scripture in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10. <clears throat> it says, I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. We are not able to plan our course, so correct me, Lord, but please be gentle. Do not correct me in anger, for I would die. <clears throat> so if God was to correct us in his anger, we would die. It would be the wrath of God. It would destroy us. We would surely die. So Jeremiah is saying, like, man, correct me. Get me right on, back onto the right course, but please be gentle when you do it. All right? <clears throat> So as we're talking about judgment, I was I was talking to Jeff, and we were we were talking about being in courtrooms and, and what that looked like, and uh, I, was, I was just thinking about the process that we go through when we get in trouble. I know most of us have been in trouble, most of us have been in court. Uh, so I was thinking like we commit a crime, we're charged with a crime, and then we go to court, and based on the evidence, the facts, uh, the judge renders his judgment, and then there's a final determination. We're either convicted or not convicted of the crime. And then if you guys are like me, you're found guilty, right? And uh, you get sentenced. And then in that moment, reality sets in because you're kind of deceiving yourself up until that point, having false hope. Thinking like maybe uh, something will give, maybe they won't find out all the truth, they'll just find out some of the truth. But God knows all things. He knows everything we do. He knows every move we make. He knows every thought that we have. He knows every time that we stifle the Spirit. And that we don't follow our convictions, even when we don't talk to our brothers about it. He knows those things. He knows our heart's desires and what we truly want. He knows our motives, right? When we go into situations and the motive behind why we're talking to people or why we're doing things or why we put ourselves in places. Like, he knows all those things. So he's like a righteous judge, right? He knows all the facts. Even before we do them. Like, he knows what we're going to do before we do them. <clears throat> so... This reminded me of, of Eden, right? The garden. And uh, just walk through it real quick. Uh, in verse, in chapter 3, verse, uh, let's see. Yeah, so 6. So it says, The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. Right there they sinned. God, God commanded them not to eat the tree. If they did, they would truly die. So they sinned, they were disobedient, and that's stifling, right? At that moment, their eyes were open, and they felt shame. They felt shame because they were guilty. They knew they were, they were guilty. They knew that they had been commanded not to eat that, that, tr that fruit from that tree, and they did it anyway. So they, they were exposed. They were naked before God, and he sees all things. They were guilty, right? So the next thing they did that we do so often is they grabbed some fig leaves and they tried to cover themselves. It's like covering our tracks, trying to do things to cover it up to make it seem like we didn't do the thing that we did that we know that we're guilty of, right? So when the cool evening breeze, breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking around in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. All right, so there's that fear of being exposed. So he said, who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. So right there, he's blame shifting. He's trying to get the, the, the blame off of himself, and he's shifting the blame. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. <clears throat> so here we see the consequence for their sin, the repercussions, the sentence that they receive. It says, then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. More than all animals, domestic and wild, you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, 
and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And then he addresses the woman. He says, Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Then he addresses the man. Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, <clears throat> the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground for which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. <clears throat> so, man, as I was praying into this, and I was, I was looking into that, knowing that we're all guilty, and I was just looking at that being found guilty, and that reality setting in, like, okay, being told four and a half years you're sentenced to, and the gavel hits the thing, there's something that happens in our heart. When that reality sinks in, like our hearts sink in our stomach, and it's like, man, there's no way out of this now. Like, I have to face it. And like, that day's coming too, right? There's going to come a day when we're not going to have a way out, but we're going to be judged for these things that we have done or haven't done, right? But in between being found guilty and being sentenced, there was the cross, right? Jesus made a way out. Listen to 1 John. <clears throat> 1 John 2. It says, My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commands. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Again, we know the spirit that he has placed in us is passionate about being faithful to the Father. We please him by his spirit that, it, that lives in us because of the cross. <clears throat> so, because of the cross, our lives are no longer, they no longer belong to us. They were ransomed by the blood of Christ. When we make our lives about us, we stifle the Holy Spirit. So as we were talking about judgment, uh, no one knows the day or time that Jesus will return. But the word of God in Revelations 19, 11 says, Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider, which is Jesus, was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. This day is coming. Don't let it catch you off guard. Don't be living a business-as-usual lifestyle, but be filled with the Spirit. Be living in a way that is pleasing to God, that is bringing honor to God, and that is glorifying His name, a way that is reflecting His image. Remember, anything out of His creation, the way that He created us to be, uh, is, is, is sin. So, if you guys want to turn Malachi 3... Two and three. <clears throat> so this is some good questions we can ask ourselves. Jesus wants to ask us these questions. <clears throat> he says, uh, who will be able to endure it when he comes? He says, who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metals, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. Dross is just uh, it's worthlessness. It's the imperfections and impurities. <clears throat> it's any image that we are reflecting that isn't Jesus. The dross is self. It's us. We are the dross, right? And we must remain in the fire in order to be purified. 
We must become less and less as he becomes more and more. 2 Corinthians 3.18 So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is spirit makes us more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. If we are looking less like him and more like the world, it stifles the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so as, it, as that Malachi was talking about a refiner, refiners know when the piece of gold or silver is pure, when they can look at it and they actually see their image reflected back at them. When all the impurities have been dripped away and there's only pure gold or silver standing there, they look into it. And when they can see their reflection, uh, they know that it's done, that it's ready, that it's purified. So who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? Only those who are reflecting his image. We must be found clothed in the, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. In, in Jesus Christ, we must be clothed. Um, Romans 13. <clears throat> Romans 13, 11 says, This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling or jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge in your evil desires. So the last place that you want to be found when Jesus returns is not wearing the proper clothes. And there will be no excuse, right? We all know. We all know now because we just heard the word of God and what it said and how we were created to be image bearers to reflect his image. So on that day when he returns, man, we won't have an excuse. We won't be able uh, to, to say, man, I didn't know or I didn't get the invitation. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what clothes to wear. We know what clothes we need to be clothed in, right? And it's the presence of Jesus Christ. And if we're clothed or reflecting anything other than the presence of Jesus Christ, we need to turn from that. We need to follow the convictions of the Holy Spirit. And we need to pursue righteousness. Right? We need to be holy because He was holy. So Matthew 22, 1, 4. <clears throat> 1 through 14. <clears throat> Alright, so it says, Jesus also told them other parables. He said, <clears throat> The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, the feast has been prepared. The bulls and fattened cattle have been killed and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. <clears throat> But the guest he had invited ignored them and went their own way. One to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious, and he set out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their towns. And he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike. And the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed one man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for the wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, Bind his hands and feet, throw him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> few are called, many are called, but few are chosen. <clears throat> Man, so with all this in sight, uh, we should really be cautious about living in a way that is pleasing to God. Uh, we should take conviction serious, uh, and we should take stifling the, the, the Holy Spirit serious, and and actually grieving the Holy Spirit by the way that we live. Man, uh, 
I long for the day that Jesus looks down over all things he created and says that it is very good. Right? So, man, we're called to be people that uh, are glorifying Jesus. And it's through his spirit that lives in us that we're able to glorify him. <clears throat> that we're able to be faithful to him. Uh, the last scripture that I have is Luke 11. Kind of to shepherd us into a time of prayer. He's talking about the shameless persistence. Jesus is teaching his disciples about prayer. <clears throat> and he tells this story. Starting in 5. He says, Then teach them more about prayer. He used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, A friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, Don't bother me. The door is locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will give up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. <clears throat> you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you simple people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so as Jesus has provided some time for us to be able to enter into prayer, um, and even from here on out, as many days as the Lord allows us to have, man, we should be uh, shamelessly persistent in our prayers for a filling of the Holy Spirit. Because it said, He will give you everything you need, not everything you want, right? What we need is to be people, a church that is filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The love, the joy, the peace. Displaying the characteristics. There's nothing, in, in Isaiah 53, there's nothing beautiful or majestic to attract us to Jesus. It was the spirit that was on the inside of him. It's who he was, right? And we should be the same thing. We shouldn't be building up our lives to attract attention to ourselves because the bodies that we have are dying, right? As, as, we, as we read, like, from the dust you came and the dust you will return, right? We need to draw people to Jesus by being filled with his Holy Spirit, right? People see that love in our life. The way we love one another directly reflects our love for Jesus Christ, right? The peace that we have, the peace in the midst of uh, uh, persecution, the peace that we can remain calm because we know that we have built our house on solid bedrock, that we follow Jesus' teaching and we obey them. We know that any storm comes through, it's not going to crash, it's not going to fall. It's not on sand, it's on the one thing that's unshakable. You know, Jesus is making a, a new heaven and new earth, and he's going to shake the old heaven and the old earth. And only unshakable things are going to remain. And that unshakable thing is Jesus Christ, right? He's the only unshakable thing. So if we're found in him, we'll be unshakable. We'll be untouched. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control, right? These are all things that are produced in our life. Faithfulness, right? I never knew what it meant to be faithful. I had never been faithful to anybody in my entire life. Man. And then I met Jesus Christ, right? And his, his character started to be produced in my life. And I started to play the tape backwards. <clears throat> I looked at my headstone, if, if I get a headstone, right? And I want that to point to Jesus. I wanted to say, here lies a man that's after God's own heart. Something that just exalts his name. And then I started to play the tape backwards with the time that I'm given. And I was all in, fully committed, wholeheartedly committed, right? And it's like, man, it's that faithfulness that is produced in us, knowing that we're being faithful to the king. It's not about people or anything like that. It's about Jesus and what he wants and, and his heart's desire, right? And we start to align ourselves with that and we start to glorify God and we start to please him. And then we start to get in this place where it's like, man, before we hit our feet on the ground, we're waking up and it's like, Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Mm -hmm. And we're going through that Psalms 19 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I rise at midnight, Psalms 119, 62. I rise at midnight to thank you, mm -hmm. right? We're setting alarms. It's like, dude, I'm going to set alarm. 
in the middle of the night, I'm going to get up, get on my knees, and I'm just going to thank you, and I'm going to shamelessly be persistent for filling with the Holy Spirit in my life. Because I'm no good to anybody that's around me if I'm not filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I'm not. I'm not no good. And I wasn't no good to the people that God gifted me with uh, for the first part of my life, you know? Uh, it was just destruction. And that's why he's like, man, you must become less and less as I become more and more. You must remain in the fire. We hear that around here a lot, but it's like, man, we must remain in the fire. When them conviction, them times, like, man, that's hot. Like, I don't want to get, I don't want to go through that, right? But it's through that flame, it's through that, that furnace that we're refined, and we know, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that there's another in the fire, that we don't have to fear. We don't have to be people that live with fear, but we can stand with confidence that we know that it's like, man, I know how this plays out. And I know that I'm not going to smell like smoke when I come out of this because Jesus is with me. Because that's the one thing that won't be shaken, right? And people start to witness that. People start to see that. People start to want that. And it's not, they want what you look like. They want who you are. The character that you're producing. The attractiveness that's on the inside. Right? So as we enter a time of prayer, man, just... Uh, really follow your convictions. Uh, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in every part of your life. And, uh, yeah. Love you guys. Love you too.